never change. Survival of Caesar as an art form depends on what? But there's room for it all. There's room for it all. Thank you, um, everybody to come out tonight to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschken. I'm the director of the Siegel Center. And uh, it is a great honor and pleasure to have with us tonight um, Hans Thies Lehmann. And it's, uh, he's been a teacher of mine. I went to the Gießen School. Actually, I think he arrived the same semester I did after the first year um, with Andre So. And as you all know, he is a heavyweight champion in the history of theater and thinking about the history of theater and combining it into uh, a, a theory that actually can be applied. And this is what uh, that Gießen School was all about. The success of it would not have been thinkable without Andre Wirth and uh, Hans Thies Lehmann and Hans Thies' book went around the world. Came with a little bit of a time difference, I think, here to the US, but still in all the many languages has been uh, translated. It is uh, obviously clear how large and how huge the impact was. And I think someone, I think maybe Peter, someone also pointed out that normally often theater reacts to philosophy or to art history or um, and to other fields. Um, but this is uh, the idea of the post-traumatic theater came out within the field of theater. And it's a very important, uh, 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 um, very important thing to know. And so we're looking for two days. We already had 10 screenings today. Uh, we have screenings all uh, day tomorrow, so have a look at the list. It was uh, possibly the first time that also these significant theater artists have been shown together. There was a little map, the star map uh, of a universe um, that they all connected uh, to each other, and not only because Hans T selected them and we also helped with it, but also because they represent what we think is truly a contemporary theater, a theater that is closer to the future, that anticipates the future instead of reworking the expected, what we uh, already know, so not just um, um, adaptations, but radical inventions. Um, the Siegel Center bridges academia and professional theater, international and American theater. So of course, an evening like this is uh, right uh, in the uh, bullseye of uh, what we are doing and is uh, very happy to see that you're coming, doing two evenings about the same theme is very dangerous. In New York, you divide your audience. Sometimes they did not come at all. So um, it's a great compliment, I think, to us that you come and also for Hans Thies that you are um, and with us. And I welcome all the students and all the professors and everybody who came out. I think Eleanor Fuchs even came out. Even so officially, she's here tomorrow. She already came. And also many of our visiting scholars from around the world um, who are here. We have a little reception um, here after the evening. So a glass of wine if you couldn't get in answer to the questions you were asked, you can do that then. It shouldn't be longer than um, 90 minutes. The format is Hans Thies will talk about 20, 25 minutes about post-traumatic theater and where it stands at the moment because, of course, it's still very, very new and still it's not, uh, uh, um, it is for some people also, they said we knew about it for 10, 15, 20 years ago. So where, are, where is it now? I mean, I met Columbia students who said, uh, Hans Thies Lehmann, who's that? I've never heard of it, was shocked. And um, others say, oh my God, this is already, you know, centuries ago. Um, and uh, so this is a quite, uh, quite um, a good time to talk about it, why it is significant, why it is important, and why we really should also use it as a model to go forward, as Brecht uh, said, or a Heiner Mutter said about Brecht, using things without criticizing is treason. He said that about Brecht, and I think the same is here. So um, it's a great honor and pleasure to have Hans Thies with us. If you have a cell phone, please take it out at the moment and um, turn, it, turn it off. After the 20, 25 minute talk from Hans Thies, there will be three sessions, 20 minutes each, with uh, the couples which is in your programs. And then we have a Q&A here. Again, really thank you all for coming. It's a great evening here uh, at the program. We are uh, truly honored. Also welcome Peter Eckersall, the EO of the program here. And um, of course, all the um, artists in the audience. So um, Hans Thies, please come and uh, join us. to be here with Frank and you all here because when you talk about post-traumatic theater today, we must actually go back to 
30 years or 20 years ago, when in Gießen we were together. And there was also Frank Henschke there. And John Jason was there. And Molly Davis was there. And this was a great moment. And I want to start by telling you something that you can't know, that when Frank Henschke was studying with us in, in Gießen, he came to New York and he found out about a certain John Jezeron. And John Jezeron came to Frankfurt and then René Polish saw what, what, René, what uh, John Jezeron did. And this was a key element in developing the theater of, John, of, of René Polish, which has now become one of the most important voices in German theater. So this is something It's great to see how this uh, history is here in the room. Now, when I started to write about post-traumatic theater, it was practically in the end of the Gießen period. And I wrote it, as you say, for den Gewehrläufen, directly, without a sabbatical or so, I was writing parallel to teaching in the university. And first of all, I would say that I did not plan in the beginning to call it just post-traumatic theater. I thought of a title like this, Studies in the Development of Theatrical Languages, something. I'm, I don't dare to think what had happened had, had, had I taken this decision to take this title. So that was one thing that uh, I didn't coin the idea of post-dramatic theater and then uh, was looking for examples like this happening too often in theater studies today. People find out the idea and then they look for proofs of it. No, I was seeing a lot of different theater works which I didn't think weren't really uh, appreciated right by the audience or by the critics. I wanted to give their names and concepts to understand it better. And then there was a second influence on the book which I think is now very important. It was the director of the Verlag der Autoren, my editor. He suggested that I don't write the long chapters I had, but the short sections that many of you may know from the book. I don't <coughs> think that the book would ever, had, uh, would ever have uh, had this influence without this structure. So the word post-dramatic theater and also the, the dramaturgical setup in small units was quite important. Now, when I wrote this, what is the difference to today? Much of what I had written about at the time was, for example, Jan Fabre or Jan Lauers, who were absolutely marginal at the time. Had somebody told me at that point Jan Favre would one day be the director of Avignon or so. I would have said, you're crazy. <laughs> really. And now this is kind of mainstream. So this is an interesting situation for a theoretician because on one hand, I, did, I intended the concept to be polemical against the theater that felt all too comfortably secured in the dramatic framework, what they were doing. The presentation on stage, the meaning, it was easily readable for an audience that was united by this meaning and so on. At the same time, however, 
I chose the title because I think that in fact there's a wider historical dimension to this phenomenon. That was why I started to write the second book. It's not that without, without a certain responsibility of Eleanor Fuchs there. <laughs> because one day she used this wonderful phrase, she said, Nautis, what actually is post-traumatic theater post two? And then I thought I should write that out. Dramatic theater, what is it? For most people, this is a, many people still today, it's a kind of what you call a pleonasm. Dramatic theater, isn't all theater dramatic? No, it isn't at all. So I thought I had written before that in 1991. I'd written about a book on a, a book about ancient Greek tragedy. Well, I called it pre-dramatic, and said there that there are strange analogies between this pre-dramatic ancient theater and the post-dramatic theater of today. I used the term post-dramatic there in 1991, but nobody cared about it. <laughs> That's uh, like always, you see. You can't have any idea. If you don't decide to write a book about it, you can't make it visible. So that was the beginning. I thought that this had the title post dramatic was not just a polemic. Uh, term for describing a whole set of different ways of doing theater different from the traditional way, but also that the European theater in general is largely defined as dramatic theater or should be defined as dramatic theater since the Renaissance, neither before nor after the 19th end of the 19th century. This, of course, gives, as Frank already mentioned, a different perspective also on theater history. Dramatic theater was a very specific development of Euro European theater from the Renaissance on. A theater where people were telling the stories in the form of dialogues making decisions in dialogues and so, and so on. And uh, this doesn't happen in other theater cultures, for example, in Japan, or other theater cultures. You don't have this dramatic structure there, not at all. But of course, the European culture was very strong because of a certain imperialism. And so we projected this dramatic theater model to all the world, practically. So if you come to China, if you come to Korea, if you come to Argentina or Brazil, you always find the same style, theater buildings, operas, and so on, with the same names as in European tradition. And this is, of course, today, an important aspect of the impact, if you want to call it that way, that the book has in many regions, I noticed. That it is taken as a kind of liberation signal from certain traditions and a kind of you know, call to weapons to find your own way of expressing yourself. So this is theater beyond drama, may also be theater beyond representation. Although, this may be a good point uh -huh. to throw in, 
theoretical reflection there on representation and critique of representation. There will always be representation. There's no way out of it. But you can make differences how, how this is dealt with. And theater as the end of representation, as the end of drama or so. These are all concepts that I don't believe in. It's like the idea of Derrida. who never said that there's a beyond a representation. So there's a theoretical point for a theater to be sought in post-traumatic theater. It is a tension between drama and theater. What many people think as a natural unity is not at all as such because drama is a limiting factor for theater. And theater always has, again, a possibility to liberate itself from this frame. There's a theoretical aspect of that critique of representation in the way I qualified it now just for a little bit. And then also there's a theoretical, there's a historical dimension. Now in the beginning of 21st century, we have a radicalizing of all these questions, I think, because up to this point, what I just said, can always always think it within the aesthetic realm in general. All of these are questions inside the aesthetic dimension. But we have now a situation where many artists feel they have to interrupt this aesthetic dimension, go into the real, go into document to game playing, to something that is not aestheticized. This makes it, of course, complicated and more difficult for us to judge. The, the task of the critic has be become much more complex now, because there are no longer any standards whereby to measure Just think now of some examples that may, as, a, as an end to this introduction, makes this a bit visual for you. For example, we have here an artist, Uwe Mengel. Uwe Mengel started in the 80s with the practice of theater, where people didn't impersonate the the figures. They didn't play a general story or anything. But the audience came into, into a shop and there were people gathered. The people were the, were the cast. And there was a criminal story supposedly had happened. And you went in and came in, went in and had conversations with these people. So there would be the father of the, of the victim, for example, or friend of the victim. And they had studied this story in terms of things that were going on in a certain 
quarter of, his, of the city. So you started with them talking about it. So everybody got the theater he was earning for himself. You might say, this is something that is not an, no longer art, but I think this is an interesting borderline. Or when you take Rimini Protocol today, with people who are cast as German, and they are there and they tell about their lives, about their profession, about their about their ideas, also where is the art then of directing? But the art of directing is there. Just the the attempt to keep these people from making a fool of themselves, because when you are not a professional, you are asked to be on stage in front of audience, you're always in danger of making a fool of yourself. So they help them. think that the political dimension of theatre has changed its face a lot. In the 70s and 80s, many people still believed we could teach something about politics by the theatre stage. Today nobody will believe. The people on stage are smarter about politics than the people in the audience. If they had the solution for political problems, they would have gone into politics and realized the solutions there. But of course, here there remains a political art form, I think, by the way it is done. It is a communal work. The utopia of theater is, I once heard, a, heard somebody of a group say, the conference is that we do something together. That's it. I think that the political dimension of theater is there today. This is a dimension of practice which is possible to do together. And this, if you want to say it, put it like this dramatic way, dim democratic aspect of theater is much more important than the messages you may try to, serve, to, to give by your theater. The social dimension of theater is happening in the performance by the contact between audience and performer. Nothing else, nowhere else. It's not in the thinking about the things he said to you or something of the sort. It's just the moment of communication that is happening. (coughs) 
theater is not in the first place something to be understood, but something to be shared. It's like telling a joke. If I tell you a joke, you look back at me like this, and you say, I've understood the joke. Something went wrong. <laughs> I think that's a model of aesthetic communication. It's not about understanding. The understanding is there too, that something else is happening. And this is also interesting to see if you look a bit closer to the classic tragedies. Here yeah, there's a moment of anagnorisis. You may, some of you may have heard that it's a moment of recognition. Aristotle identified as one of the, the great moments of effect, effective reality in theater. But this word anagnorisis, you know, it's a moment when Oedipus says, oh, oh wow, 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 the whole comes out now. It's me I was searching for. Now, this is not a knowledge, this is anagnorisis. It's a moment of insight, where suddenly he notices what is all going on. And especially what he notices is that he didn't notice it. So, theater is not a place for knowledge from one place to another, not at all. It is a moment of such insights, which may be comic or tragic, but which are like the telling of a joke or the sharing of a sad moment of somebody you love. I think that many of these aspects of theater practice have been lost in the business and also in the academia. In the business, because people are used to be sold something. They want to buy something when they go to the theater. want to buy something like a meaning, a knowledge, identification, but not this moment of a passing inside which is lost again. The academia, of course, is even worse than that respect. Theater studies. In Germany, we have the word Theaterwissenschaft. You know, it's a bit heavy. Woff, woff. <coughs> Theaterwissenschaft, theater science. It's already better you say, talk on about theater studies because it doesn't apply this systematic aspect. But if you want to have masses of students write papers for you, of course you give them a system where they can then say, okay, this is the insight, this is the knowledge, this is the definitive point. I think that in Gießen, We at least made an effort to do things differently. I remember that René Polish, for example, once or twice in his interviews, he said explicitly this, that he liked about the teachings of Wirtin Lehmann there at the time in Gießen was essentially that we didn't try to 
tell them what they should do to have success in theater. But to find out what they have to say. This, of course, takes time. And today's study programs are, on the contrary, directed toward effectiveness and speedy finishing of studies, which I find is wholly unproductive because a young person who's going to the theater should first of all have a chance to find out what's in him. And then only try to share it with others. I like to think of theater as an offer that you give to people to share an experience with you. You don't have to share it, but you there's an offer to do it. This may be a kind of closing statement. <laughs> yeah, and I think um, um, in the good old Eastern school tradition instead, what would have been easy and also fascinating to have Hansky's speaking longer, the idea now is to really also to share and uh, bring some of the artists and the, the recollected researchers and colleagues uh, them together. And I think we could go to the first uh, panel if we have 20 minutes. Um, 15 to 20 was Uwe Mengel, John Jasson, Molly Davis. And um, on new forms of theater, you already mentioned Uwe, uh, Uwe's uh, contribution, but I would like to invite uh, all three of you uh, to come up. Where's Molly? Um, over here, yes. Yeah. So please do come here. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Uwe and John, and let's talk for a moment about uh, what new forms. Beautiful. I even took notes. I never oh. take notes. <laughs> that was beautiful. Oh. I don't think you need the table. You don't need the table. For snacks. Snacks. <laughs> snacks. Yeah. Yeah. Looks more professional with water. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. Molly, did you see that? Mic, yes, it's recorded Thanks. also, and also to okay. hear better. Okay. Okay. So, new forms of theater, and uh, maybe you all talk a bit about your work and how it relates to Hans Thies's Lehmann and uh, what you, how, where you see your connection. Why don't you start? <laughs> well, I think Molly should start. Okay. Absolutely. Because, well, yeah. I do because um, I only I. Just Can you do the mic a bit Molly, closer? Molly, yeah, Molly, uh, yeah. Yeah, John is a big technical expert. Yeah, really, here. I don't know what this is. Is this a microphone? It is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's, it's not a camera. It's not a camera. Yeah. But uh, I think uh, Molly was really one of the first people at at, at Gießen, really, weren't you? Yes. Yeah, yes. Thies, it's such an it's just such a pleasure to see you and be here. It changed my life. I had done um, I was a filmmaker and I was living in um, in Stuttgart and did a show in Frankfurt at a place called Theater am Tour. Um, and Andre Schwert saw the piece and he came afterwards and he said, "We'd love you to teach at Gießen." And I said, "What's that?" He said, it's a Theater Wissenschaft, and I could imagine what that would be. I said, look, thank you so much. I'm, I was very honored, but uh, I, I know nothing about theater. He said, that'll be perfect. <laughs> so um, I said, no, you don't understand. I, I, I didn't finish college. I never was even in a school play, and I know nothing about theater. And he said, well, we're interested in doing something about Beckett, and I was so nervous, I said, I know nothing about Brecht. He said, not Brecht, Beckett. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, th the great thing for you all, that I, I assume a lot of you are, are graduate students with Frank, and, and um, this idea of openness, that's, that's what that was about. Um, 
Andres was completely convinced that the idea of opening things up, and as you said in one of the chapters, I like the s smaller chapters because of, of your book, but one was uh, cool fun, I think, mm -hmm. um, and about opening that up outside of the um, whatever is traditional, whether it's dramatic or post-dramatic, and this whole idea that um, what it is that you want to do, and I had about, there. I, I don't know if there were 12 or 15 or however many students there were, because to my enormous surprise in Germany, you don't actually have to go to class. You, who knew? <laughs> I was so pissed off once because nobody was there, and then everybody was really apologetic. They said we had to go to a lighting thing at some of the theater in Gießen. And I said, well, I came on the train all the way from Stuttgart. So you goddamn well better be here if we're going to make a piece. But everybody made something. Um, and that was uh, Andre and Thies never, um, there, was, there were absolutely no restrictions. And since, um, it, and it was terrific. We had a, a terrific time in Gießen. I mean, it was fabulous. Rene Polish um, was, um, I particularly was, I was particularly fond of Rene because he was just so weird. And his English was very odd. So I asked him to do the, uh, <laughs> the Malady de la Mort in English. Yeah. And he said, I don't act. I said, oh, come on, Rene, just get up and do it in English, which of course made it interesting. And he was, um, he and Frank, I mean, about six or seven of these people that happened to be there who taught me a lot. Let me tell you, this was, um, you guys are really, are really helping whomever your instructors, teachers, professors, whomever comes here, you're really helping them a lot because they're lost in time and space, I can tell you that right now. Isn't that right, Frank? You're uh, lost. Very much so, yes. <laughs> And uh, there was, I, I actually wrote notes down, because Tease, I thought it was so, so terrific, but the, um, there was a, something that reminded me of um, this separation and giving things space um, in language was, um, it reminded me of, of John Cage and Merce, who were separating the dance, the dance from the music and giving each, artistic dimension, some, some place to breathe around it. And um, actually John quotes Kant about saying that there are two things in life that you don't, for which you don't need to understand, and that's music and laughter. <laughs> and when you t talked about that, I thought, or about laughter, I thought about that because the... Uh, they just give you pleasure, and you don't need to understand them, you know. And that idea of it being a um, the the political as a communal gift is um, could not be more important now. No preaching, no knowing more than somebody else, no battering somebody with your political ideas, but just being open. That's good. That's exactly the point. It was already in the way we choose the students yeah. at the time. Is that right? Yeah, it was not, not the point that they did something in theater before. Yeah. Whatever they did, one was doing music, another one was doing a video clip, third one was doing something completely different. Yeah. And we chose them on the, the, on the spaces, always. Well, I've, I don't know that I've ever been with... The, a more fun, more interesting group of people, and you and you brought that on to Frankfurt too. That was uh, that continued. I mean, it was completely open. Um, Uwe, just for you, Hans has talked a bit about us of your work. Mm -hmm. How do you see your theater connected to Hans Thies's book, and was it there before? And well, no, I, I. I don't know if it was there before, or maybe at the same time. I, I don't know. Um, I think there's a, there's a, sometimes you are lucky in life when there's certain situations which basically uh, challenge you, if you feel the challenge. 
And I think that was the situation in Gießen in, in the early 80s, in, in the start in the 80s, kind of. And also when I started doing uh, this kind of what I co still call interactive performance, but now the official title is participative. It changed, but it's still the same. And um, that was the early 80s in New York, so I'm a little get old, you get the age, kind of. And it was the most amazing time in, in, the, in the art scene in New York, because you were really kind of, <coughs> people really pushed themselves to the limits in my opinion, and much more, you have the same experience, so much more open-minded in, in a certain way. And um, you went to un unusual places to create your performance. I think that's the most important thing. I grew up as a child with, with basically with theater, blah, 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 the big German theater where you have opera, blah, blah, everything and so. What I most enjoyed was the restaurant within the theater where all the performers <laughs> were. Because it's the most amazing thing to see Hamlet sitting there playing cards, you know, <laughs> till he is called on stage. So this really in intrigued me in a certain way, and I, also, I was always searching for ways to, to um, um, in, um, leave the stage behind. And Hans um, Thies mentioned that the, the worst part for me is audience participation. This is, uh, thank you for bringing that up, it's really <laughs> the worst part. You sit there and say, ah, and you, yeah, of course, you mentioned it, you make a fool of yourself. And when I say to people, oh, I do this, yeah, but in my performance, everyone's completely free to come to go anytime you want. You can come back, whatever. You can talk with a murderer, you can talk with a wife, you can talk as long as you want, you can ask any question you want, and so on. So it's a special way of creating this, and that's how we basically, basically uh, connect it I remember, actually I never taught, I never was, I was invited to Gießen, so, but I, since I'm an artist, I'm also prone to depression. And um, <laughs> when I did this, uh, this participative performance for the first time, that was in the South Bronx. And you might heard about the South Bronx in the 80s, that was hell. <laughs> but there was, an, a, there was a very famous, by now very famous gallery, Fashion Moda there. And everyone was up there, Keith Haring, Basquiat, everyone showed up there in this hell hall, so to speak. And that's why I created this performance and it got them basically, and then Andrzej Wirt called me and said, you should, you, oh, you should teach at Gießen, that's when I started. But uh, somehow I spent a few months in the hospital with a depression, so it, it never, never <laughs> worked out anyhow. But I'm, I'm very grateful for, for for Hans Lehmann's understanding of my work, because that basically um, helped help me. It, it's, it's, I mean, when you say to people, uh, I'm doing this type of work, still at my age, a lot of times I have to explain it. It's not self-explanatory, so it's, it's kind of, an, it's very interesting, so when I was in Mexico City or whatever, maybe I say, uh, I, uh, uh, why don't you read post-traumatic theater? I'm in there. Oh, you're in post-traumatic theater. <laughs> thank you. So, so thank you so very much for that. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a big help. It was help with, it was help with sponsors and so on and so on. It's kind of, it's really wonderful if you travel over the world and invited to festivals. Uh, so what, what you would, oh, uh, oh, you're in post-traumatic theater. <laughs> or the, what, what, so that really helps. It also helps. It's translated into many languages. So that's really kind of, it's, um, it's kind of, um, uh, in, in, my, in, my, in my situation, it's, 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 a, it's, a big, it's a big help. And um, what, what you just said, I would like to say that, uh, that basically uh, my, my problem is, we just discussed it in Berlin, is um, I'm, switch, I'm using now some politics behind what I'm doing. Kind of, you go to my performance, obviously you talk about the murder or something else or whatever, but behind, uh, behind are the politics. The problem is we, I can, cannot help it, but I'm interested in, in politics. But the problem is if you, if you do it in theater, it's kind of you're preaching to the choir. That's the problem. I mean, I can be as much as I want against, no names, but say, okay, just capitalism, whatever. 
uh, the people sitting in front of me, they are the same. Yeah. So that's, that's, a huge, that's a huge problem. You know? And uh, so I try to, to, to avoid this also by confronting people with people they would not usually not talk to. I just did this performance a while ago in Germany, and uh, you might, uh, might have heard about that there's this huge right-wing party in Germany, AfD, the alternative for Germany, and they're getting more powerful by the day. And all the people who go to performance and theater in this town, they would never, they don't know anyone from the AfD. So I, I created a character for, for one uh, 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 of the performers who, who was a member of the AfD. So basically you were sitting, you sit in front with, with this person and if you don't ask questions, nothing happens in my performance. You, you have to talk. And so all of a sudden they were confronted by someone who, who was a member of the AfD in his character. So as an audience, all of a sudden, I'm challenged. So, and of course, there's a certain way of training the actors. I would not say, we can also say rehearsing. But that's, that's it. So basically, I don't want to make it too long. Kind of. Yeah, maybe, um, before we go to a question to John, uh, Hans T said earlier, he looked what's out there and then tried to put it together. So in a way, your work was out there. Um, I know you also asked me, that Frank, do you have a PDF of the book? And I said, yes, I'll send it to you. So how would us post-traumatic theater mean for you in a well, book um, or in a, to your work? And well, the book, um, um, I, I mean, I just also have to sort of bring up this period of time that uh, we could say that post-traumatic theater was uh, starting to form itself. Um, because at the time that really Giesen started, I think it was a reflection of what was, you know, it was feeling of what was happening in the world already. So, you know, uh, there was the East-West. Uh, Germany was the site of the, the wall that was starting to split. People could feel it, whether they really knew it or not. That was starting to split. Uh, you could also say the Internet was actually just beginning in a very few short years. This strange thing called the Internet was going to come about all this other uh, political things, you know, sexuality was opening up. All these things were just right in that small period of time. And so I think in a way this post-traumatic theater was kind of a, a, you know, sensing all of that and that was all feeding into um, what post-traumatic theater uh, could become. Also the media, all this, that was really the center point uh, when the media was just starting to show its uh, real power. Uh, really, b right before that, in the 70s, nobody really had too much of an idea, except maybe a few social scientists somewhere who were really paranoid. <laughs> but still, um, so I think it was all, um, uh, a place like Gießen was kind of a focal point. And interesting, again, that it happened in Germany of all, of all places. I think it's very, it didn't happen uh, I mean, it, let's say it was happening, it could be happening in different parts of the uh, Western world or whatever, these kinds of ideas. But actually, it really was um, kind of focusing there. And it was that, that uh, Hans Sieks was the one who really started to notice uh, wh what is actually going on around here. It's not just sort of another trend or another uh, thing flying by. And... Um, to notice the, uh, these questions. So I do remember being in Gießen, and um, uh, it was either the first or the second time I was there, but um, I do remember that you asked me that you wanted to meet with me and talk to me about my work um, in a very serious way. Um, and of course, you know, Andre was around, but Andre was, was, had a different way of talking um, about your work, and I thought, oh my God, now I'm going to have to, <laughs> so I better get together. This guy has the real questions, and he wants real answers in a way. So that was great. So that was kind of an education for me. I thought I have to. And then, of course, I was actually um, you know, pleasantly surprised, actually, that I had uh, some answers. But I was induced to uh, give them in a way. So, that, that, I mean, that is um, uh, was what is a great part of that school is that it was able to uh, pull... Uh, these answer, questions and answers out of people and get their minds working. So that w being there was a great education for me. I mean, I was supposed to be there as a, a teacher, and I'd only started 
making theater two years before. <laughs> and suddenly I was there as a, you know, this guest professor or something. But um, uh, so it was a real education for me. And I do think that Hans, see, you were, he was already contextualizing all of these things in the things that you would say, the questions you would ask. Um, and it was kind of an interesting uh, type of um, communication with you because it was, uh, you were so curious about everything. All these things, you know, what are you doing? You weren't uh, dismissing things or, or pretending that you knew things about it. You just, it was curiosity. And so I think there was a great curiosity that actually got transferred to a lot of those students. Uh, very, very, students were very curious. Yes, we bring up, um, yeah, Renee Polish, very curious mind, a very impertinent kind of mind, you know. He, so, uh, but so curiosity to stretch out in all different creative uh, directions. And um, so, I don't know, for me, it was a, it, that was a v really kind of a focal point, which I, as time went on, I thought, oh my God, this, this is kind of a pivot here. There's actually something happening, and we seem to be part of it um, in this little town that you brought me to. And I mean, that was the other thing I have to say that these these students uh, were somehow had this idea that um, uh, in Frank's thing, you know, he he tried to sneak into one of my performances in in New York in the East Village and pass himself off as a, as a um, journalist. <laughs> yeah, somebody said there's some German kid here who says he's a journalist from Germany. <laughs> and the place was completely full. There was no seats left. And I looked over, and there's a very young, thin kid. And I just said, I'll just let him in. Let's see what happens. And so I was quite lucky to just let him in. But that, that um, the uh, students were encouraged to act upon what they were thinking. That was the other thing. So in this case, you know, Frank saw something and he, he acted upon it. He invited me. Andre invited people. You invited people. Uh, you asked questions. Um, so it was this idea of really acting upon what you were doing, not just thinking about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thinking about it was actually daydreaming in a way. So um, to act on this, uh, so... Anyway, that was... Yeah. So I think something is a pivotal, you think something did change, but we yeah. are a bit pressed up time, maybe Hans, he's just as a reaction to what your, what your colleagues say. We can't go on much longer because we have the next panel, but Hans, he's, what comes to your mind listening to these comments? Comes to my mind that also our work on theory was not distant to, to interact directly with the art. But we studied, let's say, on one seminar we did Deleuze or something, on its own right. And I think that it's a mistake that is often made now in theater studies. People try to mediate too quickly between theory and practice. Mm. But this is, this is the way. So being curious about what is happening in the theater and being curious about thinking should be, they should both have their own way. Mm. And then you can have your, your if you're lucky, then it works, it works something between them. Well, thank you, and, um, and thank you for, 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 for joining. Hans Teaser, you may be sitting, but I think I'm going to ask for the next panel. I think we're out of time, but thank you uh, for the practitioners to uh, come and join us, and we thought it was important to open with them, so thank you, really, um, for, for, for all of it. And um, Andre and Bertie, maybe um, you come and join us. And um, and now we come to um, um, what we say the performance uh, in the age uh, of performance, a title Peter Ackersall suggested. So um, maybe we move in a way, uh, a step ahead. Um, none of you have been there, or, but still your work is connected in some way to, to Hans Thies' work, so maybe give us some, some of your reflections. Go first. Uh, sure. 
So my work, uh, because it was interesting to hear how you first encountered post-traumatic, I have to say, first I studied with Rebecca Schneider as an undergrad and discovered a little bit of theater out of theater, kind of performance. Then I went to performance studies and studied with Richard Schegner. Then I came here to the PhD, and it was only when I graduated that Frank was like, because I was friends with Frank, you know, there's a book that was just translated. You really need to read this. So it was only after I graduated <laughs> with performance studies, Rebecca Schneider, and PhD that I finally um, read your book. And I always wonder why had I never been taught that book when I was either in performance studies or as a PhD, and I think this is kind of where my work is and kind of the intersections of disciplines, uh, because we were talking about everything you were saying. I felt like, oh, I wonder if live art from the UK. I was thinking of uh, the Live Art Development Agency and Lois Kadon. I was thinking about um, an essay I read that um, Andy Horowitz wrote on contemporary performance versus visual art performance. Um, I was thinking about how you include so much dance and how now there's, you were saying mainstream, there's like this market of kind of post-dramatic theater slash live art. So, and how this has become disciplined. Um, uh, so this is where I'm interested in. What's the post to the post? What's new? Because there's definitely, you go to all the, all the festivals and it's the same kind of artist um, that you're seeing. So. Now with the internet, I mean post-internet, digital, YouTube, I, I'm curious to see what the next generation um, is going to do. And I think one more thought before you speak maybe is that also with current performance art, um, how now theater is really infiltrating the, the museum, the gallery spaces, this is not something new, um, obviously, but it's now at least theater history is being taught in graduate visual art programs. And I think this is a little bit different than perhaps Black Mountain College, you know, always kind of that history of experimental. Um, so maybe, just as an example, my nephew went to Cooper Union and one day he comes and he's like, oh, I'm gonna do this really great contemporary art piece. It's on puppets. Have you ever heard of the of the <laughs> uh, Peter Schumann? I was like, Yeah, I heard of Peter <laughs> Schumann. Yeah. Um, and so, so what's new, you know, in one discipline is like this reinvention. But I think these things perhaps are emerging. The more conversations we have across disciplines, and um, so this is kind of where I'm interested in. When do we talk about live art versus performance studies versus post dramatic theater? Um, just to open it up in, in that way. So, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Frank, and thank you, Hans Ties, for inviting me to be here. It's a great honor to be in this beautiful theater. And um, so in terms of dance, this is what I'll be talking about because it's my field of study, but also, I guess, um, between more or less 86 and 98, I was working in Europe and uh, working as a dance dramaturg, which was a, something that <laughs> actually was uh, completely unheard of, in, except in one of the examples that actually appear in the book, which is to think about how Pina Bausch would be one of the uh, artists that would be included within the post-traumatic theater. So, um, so from that position, both as a dramaturg, as a dance scholar, uh, what I have to say is, uh, and, and also someone who teaches in performance studies at NYU, it seems to me that um, it's very clear from um, not only the, the intervention early today, but also from your talk in performance studies last week that we had the pleasure to have you talking a little bit longer. Um, and what's very clear is that how the notion of post-traumatic theater, as you said, is not an invention that you come up with, but it's actually the expression of a concept that emerge, emerges imminently from the practice of the artists that are surrounding you. Um, and it's as if like all of a sudden you give the name or you express the name that some of a condition that is already being there um, and it needed to be named. From the point of view of dance, that becomes really, really important because throughout the 80s and 90s, the choreographers in Europe that we're working with are facing this ongoing accusation that they are killing dance, and what they are doing is not dance. And something that um, the, your book uh, proposes, and you mentioned this today, is that 
it's not uh, post-theater, it's post-dramatic theater, right? So the equivalent for, for all of a sudden for a whole generation of choreographers and dramaturgs is that, oh, it's not that we're not doing dance, we're doing post-choreographic dance, right? The, there was dance before the invention of choreography, there, there will be dance after choreography, right? But this moment when you say that dram the dramatic theater is invented in the Renaissance, coincides with the invention of choreography also. The first time that the word appears is in 1589 in a French book, Orchéosographie, right? And 100 years later, in, this, in 1700, finally we have choreography printed on a book, right? So it's a, it's a formation of a new discipline. And in the 80s and 90s, all of a sudden, we have a group of choreographers, uh, more or less in different generations, with different concerns, different ideas, that are interested precisely in questioning the choreographic uh, within dance, just as perhaps uh, some um, uh, dramaturgs and theatre directors are interested in questioning the dramatic within, or drama within theatre. So um, I don't read German, but I remember distinctly uh, when the book came out, maybe simultaneously or a few months later, there was a short essay by you published in Ballet International, Dance Actuelle, called Post Dramatic Theatre, which is maybe 10 pages or something like that, which is a summary of your arguments. And when that fell within the realm of those who don't speak German, it, it was really like a moment of insight um, that somehow validated um, what we were doing and allowed to give us a little bit of energy. For, I was working very closely with Meg Stewart at the time and with Vera Mantero in Portugal and um, with other choreographers, and I remember distinctly the audience yelling at this choreographer, saying, dance, why don't you dance, right? And the reason that they wouldn't dance is because precisely they were questioning the imperative that is always attached to the choreographic machine, right? It's precisely this imperative to move, right? And they were questioning that. So that was these two aspects, like to create a concept out of the practice of, of the authors that surround you. I think it's exemplary for for scholars and for theorists, and we should all do it. <laughs> um, and on the, the other hand, this proposition uh, that there is something that is pre-dramatic and post-dramatic. And then like this uh, alignment between, um, let's say, um, how it was very, very curious for me to see that many examples of the post-dramatic corresponded to what perhaps in dance we were calling um, dance theater, <laughs> right? So, and, and, and that made me rethink the condition of theater uh, somehow, when, when you, because I believe uh, Meg Stewart is there and in the book, and uh, Anna Teresa Kiesmarker, and, uh, and many others. Uh, so, that was uh, very, very important. And let's see if I have, I think I had one last point, but now I can't remember. Let's see. Um, I guess that's it for now. Um, yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, that's very moving even to hear this. Because, of course, uh, dance was always in the, in the theater, important. And there was this artificial separation between speaking theatre, dance theatre and opera, music theatre and the German tradition and the European tradition. And uh, I think to find back theatre must first of all also mean find back dance. Of course also the idea that uh, language and music is not separated. Like in the ancient Greek word musique which included language, poetry, and music, and rhythm, and everything. And uh, I had a chance to collaborate during the last years a little bit with Jan Fabre. And uh, so it was a great experience because I hadn't expected his work to start to be as it was, I thought, he's a dictator who says, says, do that and that and that, nothing of the sort. It was the group that developed the ideas. Then he would select, of course. 
and uh, dance theater like Jan Faber is of course completely different from dance theater, let's say, of Max Stewart. Mm -hmm. I love both. And I don't think that it's, there's any reason to be dogmatic about this or this question. I have the feeling that, like it says in the Bible, my father's house has many rooms or something of the sort. I think this is very true for the theater today. So I feel that mostly the people who are attacking avant-garde theater as dogmatic, they are really dogmatists who say theater has to be like this, everything else has to be justified, particularly. And it's quite interesting also in relationship to, to uh, what you said um, of theater in the museum, just, just as a brief, it was the last thing I wanted to say, but I didn't write it down. <laughs> um, but in relationship also to that, I just was in Miami this weekend and there was, they were showing Tino Segal's this situation and um, what was really, really interesting was to think about how in the room, you walk into a room and then uh, in the gallery, and in that gallery there are six people who are, um, two of them are actors or dancers, but we don't know, and then the other people are professors, right? Specialists in Foucault and <laughs> like really high theory people. Um, and within that space, they create a little, a little, possibility of an encounter and I was just thinking about it's a theater without character but it's a situation and uh, and they say one of the things that Tino says is like you know maybe theater is just another name for a situation in which we are have to be engaged in what with what happens to you at that moment somehow so. it's really interesting I didn't know that because I had this concept was very important for me in post dramatic theater to say a situation in a sociological sense. Mm -hmm. A situation starts in a birthday party when the second person arrives and it ends when the second last person goes. Mm -hmm. In between there's a situation. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this is... No, I was just gonna, it's funny that we're talking about situation because I was gonna talk about well, the comment I had was on when you were speaking about dramaturgy and that in your book you mentioned, yeah, dramaturgy of a situation alive in a situation that's kind of orchestrated in time and space in a, as a durational component. And th this kind of merging of disciplines, again, I, I, one of the, th one essay I wrote, I remember reading Claire Doherty's book called Situation and I, I thought, I can't believe it. She's talking talking about situation coming, I guess, from visual art and more dance. And has she never read post-traumatic theater? You know, that's just what kept coming. So um, maybe it's a time and a place where, yeah, where these kinds of dramaturgies from different disciplines are, are more re-becoming together a little bit. Not sure, institutionally, maybe. I would like to include the also visual arts and cinema because we always had the theater, film, and media studies together in Frankfurt. And uh, I think it's extremely important that people who study theater today, they know a little bit what's going on in the cinema and in the visual arts. So there should be a lot in the museums. And also we did, for example, in Frankfurt there happened the first great exhibition about Stanley Kubrick. They were very angry in Berlin that we did it in Frankfurt. <laughs> it was a really great exhibition. And we were collaborated with it. So students were doing little performances on subjects of the films within the exhibition. It was quite interesting. And I think we should you this collaboration should be intensified today between museums and, and performance and theater studies because sometimes you just need, don't need anything else but a room in a museum and a, and a painting or something or an object 
and the performer there. And then you find out new things. And Good. Okay. I mean, if I, not, I, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll um, a bit on schedule. We also want to have really time with the audience, you know. So really, thank you, thank you for coming and contributing. And um, um, leave the microphone on the on the chair. So Sandra, really, Andre and, and Bertie, thank you for coming. And we all know these conversations could go on for much longer. Hans Eve could have spoken longer, and all our three artists, Molly and John and Uwe. But I think it gives a little insight or inspiration, and you can go as deep then as you want. We now have uh, Peter Ackersall, who is the executive officer here at the program, uh, uh, Australian professor of theater, specialist in Asian theater, but also in drama church, and Melissa, who just also finished her studies here, and to see um, what did this book mean uh, in Asia, in Asian theater, and in dramaturgy in general, but also for the, for the, for the Asian theater. What, what, uh, what, uh, what does it mean? After me, okay, sure. Hi. Um, so um, when I was asked to speak at um, this um, panel by Frank and Peter, I was thinking, oh, what am I going to talk about? Because um, when I think about my own practice and my own research in theater and performance, I never framed it uh, in terms of the post-dramatic. So my, the question to myself was, I'm wondering, why do I not frame it um, you know, um, um, uh, uh, through this term? And I realize it's because it's so naturalized in the way that I think about theater. Um, I was a theater practitioner in the 1990s um, in Singapore, and I became a scholar of theater um, in the mid-2000s till now. And I realized that the work that I've been doing and the work that I've been writing about are all post-dramatic in nature. So I've read about the book, but then I don't think about it as, um, as a term to think about the work. Um, because it's, it's, I guess it's the way I think about theater in general. Um, and then I started thinking for um, the purpose of this panel, a why is there such a prevalence in, um, of post-dramatic theater practices um, in the spaces of my study, right? So I write about um, theater practices, performance practices, interdisciplinary performance practices in post-colonial spaces, um, Singapore, Malaysia, and Hong Kong. And so my hypothesis is perhaps it's because these new um, city-states um, have a lack of a, how would I say this, um, a canon of traditional like narrative performance text, right? So how do you think about new histories? How do you perform a new nation state into being if you do not have uh, these canonical um, a text to, um, to look back on, right? So how do you perform um, self and being? Um, uh, how do you perform new history? So thinking about new dramatic forms, for example, uh, might be a good way to think about it. So, um, so if we think about the post-dramatic as, as a form of presence, as a form of, as a situation, as a moment, um, are these theater practitioners rethinking or relooking at um, traditional theater practices, right? So, so that would be, I guess, um, you know, my main hypothesis. Um, and another thing that I'm, um, and to kind of a carry on from this, I'm also thinking in terms of scholarship, could we actually look at the, um, if we look at um, a performance practices uh, with a post-dramatic lens, then perhaps we can move the conversation uh, when we think about comparative practices of Western theater forms and Asian theater forms, moving away moving the conversation away from the intercultural uh, framework to thinking about these practices to be in conversation with each other and thinking about them in terms um, um, with a transnational framework, right, rather than an intercultural framework. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Melissa. Um, I, I think I've, I'm trying to remember, but I, I think I've only ever met you twice in Europe, but I've met you about five times in Japan. Yes. <laughs> and. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, my understanding, at least, of the reception of your work in Japan. Um, before I do, though, I'd just like to briefly mention the two times that were in Europe, because I think they were, well, they were certainly very important for me. 
The first one was that I was very fortunate to attend a symposium that was made um, in, in uh, Holland, in Amsterdam, uh, organized by um, Marijke Hugelman for to celebrate the translation of post-traumatic theater into English. And there was a two or three day symposium and there was this wonderful um, presentation by one of your graduate students who was really sweating, I remember, who had to give an explanation of the theory in English uh, for this international audience. And it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was very insightful and the whole conference was really exciting. Uh, the second time was some years later when you organized what was probably the best conference of, around dramaturgy that uh, I think has ever been held uh, in Frankfurt. And uh, um, I, it was in the early 2000s and it produced the um, publication in, um, uh, and, and with several very notable essays by people like Mary van Kirkhoven and your own essay. And, and that was a remarkable event for bringing together um, some of the key dramaturgs and, and academics working in the field. Uh, quite extraordinary and, and, you know, I consider myself very fortunate to have been there. Um, and I guess the segue to Japan is that, I at least as far as I can think, um, there's a connection between the reception of the post-traumatic theatre and dramaturgy in Japan. And I think one of the interests that they've always, uh, that Japanese scholars have had in your work is, is very much exploring that connection. And um, so um, I think it was um, Hirata Eichiro who wrote uh, the first book in Japanese on dramaturgy called Dramaturgy. Uh, which was very much a kind of German history of dramaturgy. He's a German specialist who works at Keio University and uh, I think at one stage he invited you as, uh, there as a, as a visiting scholar. And then later on I met you I in association with Takayama Akira and um, Hirata, uh, uh, Hayashi Tatsuki, who are two um, theatre makers and very again, I think, a uh, strong connection to Gießen there through... Um, Takayama's work, and Takayama is, of course, working a lot in Germany now as well. Um, and they work in, a, a, well, Takayama mainly. Um, 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 I was just told that Hayashi has actually moved to the south of Japan and is uh, just bringing up a family and has given up performance. So that was quite news to me. But, um, to uh, but Takayama, of course, is very, um, very, very busy in these days. And uh, I think his work relates to post-traumatic theatre concept in, in so many ways because it's relating to concepts of the theatre of the real. Um, but also his training in Brecht and his training in uh, dramaturgy is very much a part of his... his and I think the, the German school of dramaturgy, if we call it that. Um, and then you were also part of a very extensive project organised by... Um, uh, Fuji Shintaro at Waseda University. So moving from Keio, which is one of the big uh, prestigious universities, but very much associated with a very kind of conservative education to Waseda, which was one of the um, main sites of the 60s activism uh, and the biggest theater program in Japan. And um, uh, Fuji-san organized a, a year-long symposium on uh, questions of contemporary performance, post-traumatic theatre and dramaturgy, uh, of which I remember I met you there because we were both speaking at that, that uh, seminar. Um, you know, the Japanese, uh, they, they have, for many, I mean, for centuries, they've translated everything. They're avarice translators and very often translating um, books from non-English language into Japanese before they translated into English. They translated Anton Ato before he was translated into English. And uh, they may well have translated the post-traumatic theatre before it was translated Half into before. English. Half of it, yeah. It was really the first translation that was ready was the Japanese. That's right, yeah. It was yeah. four years or so earlier than yeah. the English translation, yeah. even the yeah. French. Yeah. But, you know, there is that kind of uh, tendency to translate uh, uh, and that thirst for knowledge. But I think there's also a... a not only intellectual uh, uh, in Japan, but also the artistic, contemporary artistic community find a lot of resonances in the kind of work they're doing, um, um, particularly after the 1980s and into the present day with people like Okada Toshiki who are 
doing work that uh, is in some respects um, post-dramatic, but in other respects, of course, there's always been a post-dramatic theatre in Japan, so uh, many of the characteristics that append to Japanese, to your uh, the concept of, of post-drama or uh, how have existed in Japan for for a, a very long time indeed, you know, centuries in fact, but in different contexts. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's of course a very special relation mm. between Japan and Germany in this respect. Because on the other hand, Japanese theatre was very influential in the beginning of 20th century in Europe and Germany because <coughs> all the avant-gardists they loved the Asian theater. They loved Charlie Chaplin. It was about the only thing they could agree upon. They were all for Chaplin and for Asian theater. And um, I was very happy in, in Japan when I was there because the first time I went there was with a theater project of Hamlet, Hamlet Machine. 1992, I think, or 1991, it was. It was a friend, an Austrian director Joseph named Seiler. Joseph Seiler. And he had an invitation to work there, parallel to a Japanese who was putting on stage Hamlet to do the Hamlet machine. And uh, we sat together in Vienna. One day, and as Josef Seiler saw this, he said, you know, I'm going there. I said, oh, great. I would like to be there. He said, well, why don't you come? I said, yes, of course, why don't I come? But a few days later, a few weeks later, I received suddenly a fax. At the time, it was still a fax communication from Tokyo, Goethe Institute, if I wanted to come there on a conference on this project. I wrote at once back that I won't take the long flight to Japan just to attend a conference. But if they would host me for a few weeks so that I could see some no theater, I would come. They did this. And so I became a fan of no theater, which I think is really a great invention, theater historic. There's, there's, um also, just one other thing that I was thinking about the uh, the the use of post. Um, um, John was speaking about a, the the kind of age of post postmodernism, post dramatic theatre. But in, in Japan, there's also the concept of the post shingeki, which was uh, a theory developed by uh, one of my professors, David Goodman, um, who. who uh, uh, Shingeki is the Japanese word for the modern drama, and so he proposed the concept of the post Shingeki, for, to referring to the 60s theatre, the very radical avant-garde of the 1960s. And so um, uh, that term post Shingeki is a, is an interesting sort of parallel to the idea of the the post dramatic. And uh, I know when they translate post dramatic theatre into Japanese, they use the katakana, so it's it's post-dramatic theater. Um, it's not post-dramatic engeki, but um, but uh, there's an interesting, uh, I think, mirror or, or some some kind of parallel kind of discussion uh, around the the very active 60s theater and this idea of the post shingeki. Also, there's a kind of deep divide. How many intellectuals think that politically left theater must be realistic theater? theater in the Senjiki tradition. So they were very skeptical about no forms, the radical forms of post-dramatic theater. But I think that meanwhile this has changed. 
see there's a no connection. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the word mirror, but as you as you moved, I think it is, is one of the perhaps great functions of the book, that it did hold up a mirror in a way, uh, Hamlet's mirror that the father, theater father has died, and uh, you, you know, you look in yourself, what, what do we do now? And uh, that uh, um, it really uh, mirrored in so many forms and reflected also more light perhaps came out then. Um, even you put in, so it was just uh, uh, brilliance in, in it, in the sense um, of the word. I would say, um, since we are at eight o'clock and we don't want to go over time uh, too much, maybe we uh, open up to a few questions. Maybe since we have so many uh, participants, maybe just to Hans Tees, I think we have five, ten minutes. Um, so maybe put up some light um, um, to the audience. And I would like to thank Melissa and Peter to give a little idea for an idea of an idea how profound the uh, influence. Um, um, really was, and um, again, thank you, um, thank you all for 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 participating, and I hope you will be able to join us tomorrow. Um, we need a good audience, and uh, that's we need good theater, but we also need good audience, and it's fantastic to to have such a great audience with you here. So, um, some comments or um, a question for Hans Thies. Um We have the microphone again, not only uh, that we hear you but it is also being recorded. Hi, hello. Um, thanks for coming. Um, I'm a student here at the PhD uh, program, and I like the um, offer of thinking about theater as a joke. Um, I connect to that very much. And I wanted to ask, as a theater scholar, is, your, is our job to explain the joke? Um, in other words, how do you relate to the joke, to that uh, aesthetic communication, I believe you, ca you called it, aspect as a scholar? That's of course a very a question that you cannot answer generally, I think. Why? You can write about theater by taking a step away from it or going very close to it. Mostly academic discourse remains in the middle distance. We don't find out anything. So you can go into the details or you can go to the theoretical dimension of it. And I think the second No, let me put it in another way. I think with the joke, with aesthetic communication, it's the same thing. You can relate to it in forms of theory. For example, if you take the Freudian theory of the joke, you find there exactly this model. He says, when you take your tell a joke and then you laugh with the laughter in the end, when you have told your point, it's exactly it's a kind of zündung. How did you say that? Uh, initiation. initiation between the subconscious of one and the other. That's the aspect of the element there. And I think that with Lacan, if you have a possibility to Theorize this my mechanism a bit wide. It would, however, be too difficult to explain, I'm afraid, now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, another session comment? Hello. Um, this is really a pleasure to meet you. Um, I've been, I've been knowing your work for some time now, and um, I wanted to ask uh, about the um, place of the text in post dramatic theater. As uh, we talked a lot about dance and performance, installation, and um, how much, and of course the importance of Arto in this, what we may call maybe a tradition now. Um, what would a post-dramatic theatrical writing look like as a practice? I'm thinking um, there are some 
writers, I believe, that could somewhat fit in that category. Like, um, I am, uh, I know well the work of Valère Novarina, for instance, the French playwright, somebody who, who writes beyond, you know, representation or is it writing as a form of performance. I wanted to know if you would just comment more on this. I would love to, especially since I constantly have to fight the misunderstanding. Post-dramatic theater would be theater against the text, which is of course nonsensical. Where to start? There are texts by Fridy Jelinek, by René Polish, by Sarah Kane, by a number of other authors, which are great and which correspond, in my opinion, exactly to the, to the post-dramatic style or mentality or whatever you want to call it. So there's obviously a number of great writers in our days. I don't mention Heiner Müller, of course, because it's so evident. So on one hand, you have this dimension of authors who write in a post dramatic way. On the other hand, you have a lot of text work. For example, in Fast Entertainment, you know Fast Entertainment, certainly. Wonderful theater, one of my absolute favorites. However, it's really textual theater, it's text theater. So I think the, the function of text in post-dramatic theater is just as essential as it was in dramatic theater, only in other ways. And I feel that I'm happy about much post-dramatic theater because it's liberating the text as literary phenomenon from the reduction to role text. Thank you. Another <coughs> one or two more, some comments or thoughts? Um, then, um, yeah, no, no, I think we, 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 we'll, we'll go on with this. We will also have a, tomorrow, maybe you, you will stick around. We have a small reception um, also here, and we are also already a bit over time, 10, 15 minutes. So um, really, um, thank you all for coming. And thank you, Hans Thies, of course, for doing all the way here. And thank you.